something totally different for you. And I know it's tough when you ask people to play amateur psychologists, so I'm not expecting qualified advice or thoughts here, but it just struck me, Michael Carrick's book is being serialised at the moment and it's in the Times. And obviously players get disappointed after games, but it seemed the defeat to Barcelona in 09 in Rome sparked off two years effectively of depression for Carrick. So here's the gist of some of what he's saying. Uh, one of the reasons he was so disappointed after the game is that a sloppy pass of his contributed directly to one of the Barcelona goals. And, you know, it's a, it's a horrible night and they had gone 25 European games unbeaten and afterwards in the dressing room, Ferguson saying, well, if we want to play at this level, we're going to have to ask ourselves some questions. And so he has uh, a few bad days, as you can imagine, but it doesn't lift. It's not the ordinary a week or two or three max and then it subsides. So he says, depression over a game of football sounds extreme, doesn't it? But I genuinely felt in a very dark place. It might sound a crazy exaggeration comparing football to a death. But after Rome, I felt like I was grieving. Six months earlier, we'd been crowned the best team in the world. And now I tortured myself with questions about why we'd come second. I never talked with Rome about the boss. I can't. It's too painful. Even now, almost a decade on, the gloom from Rome has not completely gone. I returned pre-season. I couldn't shake off the depression. 09-10 was my worst season for United. I had lost the edge. I had a heavy head and a heavy heart. Even my body felt heavier. Nothing came easy. I felt like I was stuck in a rut. Stop, start. I tried. I couldn't shake myself to life. In games, I went from having a calm, clear, sharp mind to a cloudy, slow, uncertain one. I went from seeing the best option without even thinking to seeing six things at once and choosing the worst one at the wrong time. I knew it was all in my head but I felt I couldn't turn to anyone for help. I'm too stubborn. I was trapped in a vicious circle. My football suffered because of my bleak mood, which made me feel worse, so my mood darkened further. And he talks about going to the World Cup that following summer. Lisa, his wife, definitely knew how bad a state I was in, especially during the World Cup in 2010. In South Africa, I was in a really bad way, homesick as well as depressed. Physically, I was in my prime. Emotionally, I was a wreck. I mean, I was going to say, wow, and how surprising. But it's never surprising when someone's struggling behind the scenes. I am struck by the fact that Michael Carrick, though, fresh off winning the Champions League the year before, continuing to win leagues with Manchester United, couldn't digest that result a tad better, given how experienced he was at that stage. It's, uh, it's a remarkable contribution. Yeah, it's quite stunning. Um, first of all, um, real depression, which it sounds like it was you know, a version of it, it's a medical thing. So uh, he didn't ask anyone for help at the time, so he self-diagnosed. Now, self-diagnosis is famously difficult, yeah. but particularly difficult in any mental problems. Uh, if you go for help, speak to people, uh, there is an opportunity to then find out what may be set off, but then what is the reason for it continuing? Um, back in you know 2010, whatever, it may well be that, you know, the a, there wasn't help. I probably was some help if he'd have asked. But certainly, it's something now that within the game, you're expected to go and ask and talk about it. Um, and there are plenty of players, we know lots and lots of them now, that have come out and spoken about it. And because they've done that, there is that, op that possibility for others to do it. Um, mm. But famously, people who are suffering from depression, it's self-diagnosis is not a great thing. It's You really do need help. That's why you should go and ask for it. So... Yeah, that may well have set it off, but I'm not absolutely convinced, you know, it will be the total reasons for it. Now, you're asking me to be a psychologist. I'm not a psycho. I studied psychology for a couple of years, but, you know, it, it definitely needs professional help in those sort of situations. And it's a real dis disappointment for him. But then that was the game, or that was certainly professional sport. And when I played, it was definitely, it, you, you show no weakness whatsoever. Uh, oddly enough, I had a recent, I think just today, uh, Jordi Cruyff talking about his dad. Mm. He used to come back after games and when he was a manager or whatever and was neither up nor down about it, you know, and showed nothing and gave nothing away. And I remember a, a, an old friend of mine who was a very wise person, when I said to him, you know, I didn't show anything, I was calm, you know, showed nothing at all. His answer was, tick, tick, mm. tick, mm. as in it's going to blow. Mm. It will blow. You need to share um, and I kind of shrugged that off. Um, but certainly there are people out there. And you see Johan Cruyff, I mean, the genius and possibly the most important game, the person in the game of football in the last 100 years. There's a good argument for that, for what he's done. But, you know, he ends up having heart attacks. You know, he smokes constantly. 
uh, it's not a good idea to keep it within. So it's good that Michael's talking about it, um, but I think a, a period talking to you know intelligent, good people that understand it would give him, him a lot more understanding of it. And what it says now, which is the reason why he's talking about it, is if you are another player suffering from that, go and talk about it. Listen to people like Neil Lennon who have gone through it. They'll say exactly that. Mm. He makes a good point about the self-diagnosis because, you know, nearly I suppose, the majority of depression cases you, you read, it'll be something like, you know, I just didn't know what was wrong with me. And then there was a measure of relief when the doctor said, you know, well, that's what you have because, you know, it, it gave it a name and it gave you something to fight. Um, but I still think, um, while that, it doesn't sound like, it sounds like maybe a, a mild version of depression in the overall scheme of things, at the same time it's good that he's talking about it because every little helps I think with regard to that. There's, there's a fancifully small number of people in sports who admit to, the, to depression and the figures just cannot be right because it's so profoundly um, common that, you know, while sports people live relatively healthy lives compared to the rest of us, they certainly have it. And, you know, if you read Robert Enka's book, um, I thought that was... Which I did, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was tough going, Pat. I, I, I think that's probably the toughest book I've ever read um, because it didn't end happily. There was no Hollywood ending there. And, you know, he spoke about... He, he used to have write a little diary and... Um, Towards the end, he did. He was very well. He was doing very well if he could put two or three words together in a week. You know, he was just. And there was a, there was an iconic photo of him in um, Istanbul. Um, after he, I think he signed for Galatasaray, but he was in a very bad way at the time. And I remember that photo because um, it was in the book and the torture in his face. You could just see it. But what really frightened me about that book was that he was playing pretty well while in a very very bad way. He yeah. he could somehow go on the pitch in a solitary position and people just wouldn't know and that's what really really frightened me about it um, and and the Carrick thing probably none of his teammates or very few of them even suspected I would have thought quite probably no, not no they, they wouldn't do but um, I talked to the author I interviewed the author about um, about Robert and what he'd gone through mm. and he certainly felt that although stresses and pressures will end it sort of add to it now, being a professional footballer, everyone will tell you it's great fun, you earn lots of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the stress, like any extreme um, job, you know, your job's on the line every single day. Mm. Your job's on the line and people are watching you every day. So there are stresses and pressures. I'm not sure. You make a great point, Johnny, about um, prevalence in, you know, top-level sport. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would like to see some stats on that. The reason being, if you are prone to depression and and it's something that manifests itself earlier in life it may well be that you never get to the top because of that mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons it stops you getting there so it may well be that in certain professional sports although it is extreme in certain cases it may well be not as prevalent as uh, in many other sort of areas of society i remember someone saying and it just shows you how different it can be people often say they're afraid why are there no gay footballers you know, it's uh, the percentage in, let's say, the percentage in population, I don't know what it is, but let's say it's 10%. Yeah. And why is there no gay footballers or only 1%? <laughs> it's and funny you say that, Pat, because I was going to say that as well. It was like another complete statistical anomaly that, like, clearly, well, you know. The anomaly, the anomaly is easily explained away. Yeah. Well, number one, people won't come out. That's number one. Number two, I used to be a big fan of the ballet. You know, I used to go down to the ballet, the Royal Ballet in, in London at Covent Garden. And I can promise you it wasn't one in ten of the ballet, the male ballet dancers were gay. I can promise you it wasn't one in ten. Hell of a lot more than that. Yeah. You're and a fan of the ballet? Yes, I am. I have always have been. So, Did I know that? Yeah, yeah so um, my, I was very good friends with one of the ballerinas who was a principal down there. So I used to stand on the sides, sort of uh, looking at the ballerina, at the, one of the greatest ballet companies in the world. Hmm. And I'd be in the wings watching it. And it's the most extraordinary thing because... There are actually amazingly, amazing similarities between football and ballet. I mean, it's amazing to say. Balance and all that. Um, well, oddly enough, injuries are almost exactly the same. Being asked to perform while injured is exactly the same. Um, expectations that if you have one bad night, you're finished. And all those pressures. So people don't think about it, but I, I 
the ballet dancers that I knew, they all felt exactly the same things that I was going through in football with just that sort of stress, stress and expectation. Mm. And of course, the audience, the point is you can't show them you're injured. Yeah. It's, the, it's the antithesis of what you can do. So there's a lot of psychological similarities there, but there are statistical anomalies within it. Now, there, will, there, are be, there have been in the PFA, certainly, um, have worked on it. And I, I actually interviewed Tony Adams recently up at the Edinburgh Festival, and he was talking about that, about depression leading to a variety of other things. So we know it's there. We know it can be extreme. And the, the fact that you're in an industry where you're expected to show we no weakness mm -hmm. does not help. And the, the point you were going to make about the anomalies with ballet and football is, frankly, football is not a very welcoming place. So you spot pretty quickly that homophobic slurs are commonplace and maybe you go somewhere where they're not. That's the, the point you were making before we interrupted that, that. That's one of yeah. the points. It's definitely one of the points. You, you go to where you would feel more comfortable um, and that would certainly be the case. Uh, to be honest, to underline this one thing, that another anomaly I would suggest, first gay player that comes out, he'll be fine. Within the game, it'll be absolutely okay. Not yeah. sure it'll be the same in the media or... Ne well, I think it will be okay in the media. On the terraces and online, hmm, yeah. maybe a bit tougher. Well, the merest weakness is seized upon, isn't it?